Hello, everyone, and welcome to the March 14th episode of Pub Talk Live, the usually live publishing talk show airing the second and fourth Saturday of every month at 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, so today I am not live because I was supposed to have the Orlando Book Festival today, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. And also two of my best friends are in town, and so we had some plans. So um, I wasn't able to do the show live, but I am recording this part on Saturday. And I interviewed Lily on Wednesday, and so you'll see that in just a minute. Uh, I'm your host, Sarah Nicholas. I'm a young adult author. I'm on the board for Pitch Wars, and I'm a library event planner. Uh, you can subscribe to Reminders via email by clicking on the link in the description so you don't miss a show. You can also follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Pub Talk Live. And if you'd like to support the show, you can find the link to the Patreon near the end of the video description down below. So I do not have a special, I mean, a guest co-host today. So um, I'm just going to be doing the news by myself. <laughs> so we'll see how this goes. Um, I'll do, I, I mean, obviously there's like one big piece of news that everyone's talking about, but I'll do that at the end. <laughs> uh, so Hachette Book Group employees walked out on March 5th to protest the publisher announcing it would publish a memoir from accused sexual abuser Woody Allen. Uh, after this, the publisher decided that they're not going to publish the book after all and will return the rights to the author. Um, and everyone seems to be pretty happy with that second announcement, not so much the first announcement, except for uh, Stephen King, who said that it would be a slippery slope or something. Um, not his best moment. <laughs> the uh, UK government announced just this week that it will abolish the VAT charge on all digital reading materials, including books, which sounds good. Anything that can make books more affordable is a great thing, as long as it doesn't cut into the author's meager profits, right? Um, Viacom CBS is looking to sell Simon & Schuster, which is one of the big five in the United States. The chief executive said the publisher is, quote, not a core asset of the company, it is not video based. It doesn't have significant connectivity to our broader business, end quote. That sounds depressing. Um, I just, I, I, saying it's not a core asset of the company when it's one of the biggest publishers in the United States is just, that's something else. So the news does not get happier from here on out. <laughs> um, oh, we do actually have a good news here, right here. Delacorte launched a new original YA trade paperback imprint called Underlined, which is named after Random House's online community focused on YA books and creative writing. The creative writing community has more than 35,000 members currently. Um, I know several authors who have books on this line, and so it, it's going to be pretty good. It's going to be a paperback original, which means that they don't come in out in hardback before. they um, The first release is a paperback, um, which happens a lot in, in romance and sometimes in science fiction and fantasy and also in young adult because those books are obviously more affordable for the readers. Uh, the audio award ceremony was held on March 3rd in New York City with um, The Only Plane in the Sky, An Oral History of 9-11 by Garrett M. Graff, taking home the award for 2020 Audiobook of the Year. Uh, some of you may remember that I was a judge for the Audis. I, I don't think I'm allowed to tell you what category, um, but the winner of the Business and Personal Development category is the first book that was this show's audiobook of the week. Uh, so You Want to Start a Podcast by Kristen Meinzer. Um, and that book helped me shape this book, this show a lot and helped me kind of figure out what I was doing with the show. And so it was actually our first audiobook of the week for the show. And so obviously I'm excited that Kristen won that one. She both wrote and narrates that audiobook. Um, and you can see the full list of winners at the link in the description down below. Um, for if this is your first time watching the show, um, I always put the links for all of the uh, articles that I talk about 
uh, in the description so that if you want to read more about each topic, you can find that info down there. Um, let's see. Starting on April 27th, this is good news, I think, for everyone except scammers. Um, Ingram's print-on-demand service, Lightning Source, will remove print books from its catalog that violate content guidelines that will, quote, do harm to readers, including unlicensed summaries, books mimicking popular titles or authors, books likely to cause confusion, and books created using AI or automation. They're also removing books that are more than a certain percentage blank pages, such as like journal books. And I think this is a great thing because this has been a problem in, in the kind of self-publishing, the scammy side of self-publishing for a while is people publishing books that look exactly like bestsellers or they use like the same name as a bestselling author um, or, you know, things like that. And so I think this is going to, this is a good move and I'm glad that they're doing this and I wish that Amazon would do similarly, especially for eBooks. Okay. Lucasfilm finally revealed the project they've been calling Project Luminous. Um, Star Wars The High Republic is a series of adult and young adult novels, children's books, and comics from multiple publishers set 200 years before the events of The Phantom Menace. It features the Jedi as, quote, true guardians of peace and justice in a, quote, hopefully optimistic time. So that's exciting. I think a lot of people are excited to see kind of the Jedi in all of their glory. But of course, there's going to be some evil coming, right? Um, and so Daniel Jose Older is one of the authors that's working on this. And I love everything that he does. So I look forward to seeing what comes out of that. And if you watch kind of the video that they made when they announced it, um, you see they, they met together um, at the Skywalker Ranch and they have these whiteboards where they just were literally allowed to throw whatever ideas out they wanted. And someone spotted that at some point the whiteboard said dinosaurs on it, which was almost definitely Daniel's doing. <laughs> so maybe we'll see some dinosaurs in Star Wars. Probably not. Uh, this is some sad news. Barbara, Barbara Neely, the author of the Blanche White series and the Mystery Writers of America, 2020 Grandmaster died last week at the age of 78. Um, I'm going to put a link down below for the mystery writers announcement. But uh, my friend Kelly Garrett, one of the first guests on the show, she wrote a post about it as well. And she was interviewed in the media for it. So um, I will try to find those links and add those down below. So the biggest news in publishing right now is the biggest news everywhere right now. Um, coronavirus, COVID-19 is wreaking havoc on the industry, especially when it comes to events. Um, so the London Book Fair was canceled on March 4th, one week before it was set to start due to coronavirus fears. It's one of the world's biggest literary events with a normal attendance of around 25,000 people. They canceled only after a lot of publishers and agencies pulled out. I mean, many people were angry that they waited so long to pull the plug because now they're all scrambling to get their um, ticket purchases back and everything. The Bologna, Bologna, I did look up how to say it. We talked about this last time. It's Bologna. That's how you say the city. Children's Book Fair was rescheduled for May 4th through the 7th. But two major publishers have already pulled out due to coronavirus concerns. Penguin Random House and Simon Schuster have canceled their plans, which has many in the publishing industry doubting the viability of the fair. It looks like that one is probably either going to get canceled or uh, rescheduled once again because a lot of major publishers are pulling out. Um, other canceled events include the National Book Critics Circle Awards, Tucson Best Festival of Books, Abu Dhabi International Book Fair, Nova Teen Book Festival, Paris Book Fair, Poets and Writers 50th Anniversary Gala, LA Times Festival, Virginia Festival of the Book, Texas Library Association Conference, and many, many more, including the Orlando Book Festival, which was scheduled to happen today, and I uh, run. <laughs> um, so I spent the last two days basically emailing everyone and canceling everything and taking down signage and um, taking apart like author packets and 
name tags and it was all very depressing. <laughs> Uh, all this work that I had done, just undone, and it would never be used. Um, and of course, we made the right decision. We see about 500 people at that book festival. So we wanted to make sure we weren't contributing to the spread of the disease, but it's still very, very sad. Um, well, in some more hopeful news, bookstores in Beijing struggling to survive teamed up with a popular food delivery app to deliver books. Uh, and you can read more about that in the description down below. But can you just imagine like Grubhub or whatever? I don't know the other ones. <laughs> um, delivering books for bookstores in major cities. That would be really cool. A lot of um, indie bookstores, by the way, are having some trouble because people are coming to their stores. And a lot of them are actually offering shipping discounts and delivery in the cities that they're in. So if you have an indie bookstore near you that you like and you want to make sure they stay open through all this, um, go and check them out. And I am ad-libbing now, but also there is a website called bookshop.org. I'm going to type that out for you guys so it's on the screen. Bookshop.org is a website. It's a, basically a book distribution website, um, but it supports indie bookstores. So indie bookstores can sign up for an account there and then they get basically a percentage of everything that's sold. Um, and then if they set up um, you know, a site on, on the website, they get a 10% off of anything that's sold on their websites as well. So check out bookshop.org. Bookshop it's in beta, it's brand new, um, but this is kind of a good time to start supporting that site because a lot of indie bookstores are gonna be struggling right now. Um, some more good news, I guess. I'm working with uh, many authors, including Ellen O, to bring you the Everywhere Book Fest on May 1st and 2nd. It's a virtual gathering of kid lit authors, books, and readers that will bring the book festival experience to everyone. You can follow it on um, Everywhere Fest on Twitter, and you can check out everywherebookfest.com for more info. Um, it is still in development, so there is not much info on the website right now but we are working very hard on it and I am helping, um, no surprise here with the uh, video platform. So I'm gonna be helping out with the technology side of things, along with Gail Villanueva, who's also the tech director for Pitch Wars. So we are once again, gonna be working on a big project together, which is amazing because I love Gail so much. Um, so check out that website if you're um, sad about your favorite kid lit or YA book festival being canceled. Um, that may be something. And I think we're going to try to have uh, some content that uh, teachers and librarians, school librarians can use as well. And so if you are interested in that, if, you had, if you've had to cancel an author event for that, um, make sure you check them out. Um, our last piece of news is something we discussed on the November 23rd episode of this show with Diana Foe. Um, the former Baltimore Mayor Catherine Pugh was sentenced to three years in prison for her children's book fraud thing issue. Um, if you don't remember, she was basically having organizations buy large orders of her books and then they would get city contracts soon after. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's something related to the book industry um, that kind of caught a lot of people's attention but she has been sentenced to three years in prison for that. Um, and I think she was up for a lot more. So I'm filming this segment right now on Saturday. I was gonna say morning, but it's right around noon. Um, and then I uh, interviewed Lily on Wednesday. And so we're gonna go back in time a little bit and then we will come back to the future, present, past. I don't know. Time is weird. Um, so Lily Mead is a young adult author represented by Elena Roth Parker. Her writing has been published in Bustle and Teen Vogue. When not writing, she films educational videos on the craft of storytelling for her YouTube channel and recently launched a writer-focused planner company. So please welcome to the show, Lily Mead. Hi, Lily. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Um, Uli, I wanted to invite you on the show to talk about AuthorTube primarily. And so could you start out 
by explaining a little bit what AuthorTube is for those who aren't really familiar. AuthorTube is um, basically a fun name for author or writer YouTubers, which is anyone who uses YouTube to talk about the writing process or writing advice or um, the publishing industry, sort of. Sort of. Um, when I created the Facebook group for it with Clarabel Ortega, um, it was sort of to give a home for people who weren't really doing book reviews, um, which isn't to say that people who do book reviews and are part of BookTube aren't allowed in AuthorTube, um, but to have a home for people whose main purpose in being on YouTube was to talk about their own work. Okay, great. Um, and I'm gonna, I had on here to ask you about the Facebook group, so I'm gonna go ahead and jump <laughs> to that um, since you mentioned it. Uh, so you started the group, you said with Clarabelle? Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure who you started with, great, okay. Um, so other tubers can kind of learn from and connect with each other. Um, so can you tell us about that group and if someone might be interested in joining it, what they could get out of it? Oh yes, I love the group. Um... It, it's been, I've been running it sort of myself for the past few years, which has been a bit difficult because I had a crazy past few years, but um, this, over the winter, I've developed a mod team that um, includes uh, Jenny Streety, uh, Kara Brown, Alexa Dunn, um, and we've come up with lots of great ideas for the group, including daily um like themed post we have monday brags wednesday writing updates fml fridays um and we're planning on instituting more um as we grow like monthly challenges and um creator spotlights it's a very big group there are um almost 900 members so you are sure to find somebody who's writing the same types of things that you are. Wow. And you are definitely sure to find people who are willing to cheer you on and check out your first videos and all sorts of stuff. It's a great resource and I'm really proud of it. Cool. Um, I'm in the group. <laughs> I, am, I am what people call a lurker though. So. Uh, <laughs> I do a um, lot of lurking too, but as an admin, <laughs> I, I can't do much. Though. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so what are your some of your favorite things about being part of the AuthorTube community? Um, I like I like helping people and I like talking about inspiration and um, I feel like AuthorTube is a way to share knowledge in a really like creative um, way that's different than other educational sort of things. Um, because I can talk about my process and what inspires me, and that's not technically wrong, even if you do it a, a different way. Um, and it's generally a really supportive group. We've had a couple hiccups with drama, but I don't think nearly as much as some other niche groups of YouTube have. Um, not because it's more like insular. I know that writing personally is a much more like personal private thing but um writing as a community just seems to be a um, more supportive like group mm -hmm. um i love that you mentioned that because that's actually my next question <laughs> so you're um part of both the author tube and the ya community yes um, i am i am i am <laughs> <laughs> those are two groups that um at least from the outside are often seen as plagued with toxic behavior and infighting. Um, do you think that's a fair judgment of those communities? Um, not as like a whole. Um, I agree that like any group can have bad actors and I can definitely see how people could view the young adult community as, um, I don't want to. I don't want to use the word toxic, though. There are certain toxic parts, but there's toxic parts of any group. But um, people can get really passionate and defensive, um, and I think that's part of the nature of 
who our audience is, not to say that because we write for teens that everybody's clicky and, and judgmental, but because we write for like children and we, we write for people going through a really intense time in their lives, it's really important to us um, to represent those people accurately. And when you're writing to um, an age group that's going through so much, um, you 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 empathize with them a lot, and um, I guess that can rub off. Um, and with YouTube, I think YouTube in general, like it's 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 one of it's one of the social medias where you benefit more by being more personal and vulnerable. People don't go to go to a YouTube video to learn how to do something like clinically. They want to hear how to do it from a friend. You benefit more if you treat your subscribers as if they are a friend of yours. And when you are that vulnerable on the internet, it's it definitely um, makes things a bit harder to just like let go when you're being harassed or um, if there's an issue you care passionately about. Uh, so I wouldn't say that either either group is toxic as a whole. I I mean any group can have toxic people, but yeah. I do I do see especially for both why people would get so passionate. And people can always go over the top, but I can definitely see why the passion is there and I'd rather have the passion there and occasionally have some hiccups than not have the passion there. Yeah, I think in YA especially um uh, the the stakes are higher. So if people yeah. are writing, um, you know, harmful books or whatever, the stakes are higher than if you're writing in in adult mystery or things like that. Um, all right. So I struggle with this. So I'm just gonna um, basically I'm just asking you for advice, and I'm gonna put it out on the internet. <laughs> um, so how do you come up with new ideas for video topics all the time, and how do you keep um, your content fresh? I come up with so many ideas. I actually have, um, I use a project management tool, you know, like a Trello or, Asana, or Asana. I don't use either of those cause I have m my own, but, um, it's pretty much similar to that, um, where you can separate things into like lists of ideas, partially researched, partially drafted, ready to film. Um, and I have like 80 ideas in there. What's harder for me is to actually have the time or space to film them. Um, anytime I'm reading a book, I love reading writing craft books. It's like an obsession of mine. Um, I will, if, if I read something and it gives me an idea, I take a note and I put it in this thing. Um, when I'm talking to people, because uh, when you're a writer, you often talk about little nitpicky writey things with uh, friends and even family. Like my mom asks me things sometimes, my brother asks me things sometimes, and I'm like, oh, that would make a good, vi good video idea. And I go and put it in there. Um, and also once you start like building uh, an audience, they start to suggest things themselves. I've actually recently made like a form, two forms actually, one where people can submit collaboration ideas. Like if we're gonna be at an event together or if they're just an author who wants to like do something like this and um, chat about their own writing experience um, on my channel. And I also have one that's just for like viewer submitted ideas where they don't care about being involved. They'd love, love credit though, um, but they wanna submit an idea. I also, um, I have like a personal branding motto, which is life inspired by fiction. Um, so anything that falls under that idea is something that I can film. And if it doesn't fall under that idea, then it's probably not a good fit for my audience. But that means that I can talk about my personal life because it's a life inspired by fiction. Um, things that inspire me, books that inspire me, um, and my own career updates. So it's, 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 it's pretty easy to um, figure out what belongs if it fits under that bottom. 
All right, someone just knocked on my door, so I will be right back. <laughs> so yeah. you're like the guy coming to fix your internet? Yeah, um, which I had no idea was happening. Um, so he was like, you don't know about this appointment, do you? And I was like, no. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so he's going to wait in his truck until we're done. <laughs> So with a lot of book events being canceled due to coronavirus concerns, um, authors are turning to online video content in big waves right now. Um, how do you think book and author tubers can and should be a part of that? Um, well, there was the recently uh, held Write On Con, um, which I think is super cool. I love the idea of an accessible video conference. Um, uh, I've only been to a couple book events and each time I've gone, I've tried to film the panels that I could attend um, because I know it's like, it's an opportunity that a lot of people don't get. So I think um, like author tube and like video or virtual sort of events um, should be a bigger thing than just to avoid getting sick. Um, one, because they're more accessible and they're evergreen. I mean, you can go somewhere and interact with people for a couple days, but if you um, film a, a conference and do a virtual conference, that can live forever. Um, I know that I, if I find a YouTube video that's like four or five years old and it's relevant to what I was looking for or what I'm interested in, I'm still going to watch it, even though it didn't happen yesterday. So i um, I think it's it's important uh, not just for yourself so that you don't end up canceling book tours and have no way of interacting with people, which I've heard has been happening and is just an absolute horror show. Um, but also it's just m much more accessible to people. Yeah. Um, I have been, so I've been seeing on the author side a whole bunch of people starting to kind of plan their own video-based you know, content to replace in-person events that were canceled. Um, but I haven't seen a lot of interaction between author tubers and book tubers and, and authors, and which I feel to me is like an obvious direction that people would go in, but I haven't really seen it. And I'm like, why aren't you reaching out to these people who already have the experience with video content one and the audience, you know? Yeah. Um, about about booktubers typically they usually have like partnerships and i know some of my booktuber friends literally have like agents um so it might be a bit more oh, more difficult but i would definitely see um reaching out to friends that you know who are author tubers um uh i actually when alexa was setting up her youtube channel she was always asking me for questions and now i think she's like like eclipsed my my following by like five times um so yeah definitely um like i said i've had a, a hectic like year and a half so my youtube channel is currently like a little bit spotty but when i return to active videos um as soon as i finish my editing program that i'm going through through school um working with other authors definitely definitely high on my priority list because i mean it's good for me because it brings in a new audience their audience but it's also good it's just good publicity it it, it, it really isn't something to be afraid of if you're open to doing youtube i mean i'm doing this from my bed right now <laughs> uh it's it's not that hard to yeah i'm not my kitchen it. table <laughs> yeah. um so for anyone who's watching, you might have heard Jasper before, but you're hearing him a lot more today because uh, there is a cable repairman outside my window and he does not like men in hats. <laughs> um, so please excuse him. <laughs> um, so you, um, you do something cool. You provide captions on all your videos, right? Um, can you provide advice to other YouTubers on how they might do this for their viewers. Well, there are there are paid services that you can use. They're like a dollar 
per minute. I don't use those. Um, I, I can't afford it, but also because I don't really need to. I script my videos. Um, so pretty much almost everything I say follows what I had planned to say. Mm -hmm. So once I've uploaded the video, I can literally just input the text and it will try and match mm. what I've inputted to the video. And then I just go through it quickly and make sure that it lines up correctly, um, change for any ad libs that I might've done. And then I can click okay and it's, it's just like that. But also if you upload a video and you like leave it for a couple hours, which I always do because whenever I upload something, I usually schedule it to publish later. I don't upload it the day of. Um, and so if you have like a buffer of a couple hours between you when you upload it and when you go to like add in details, YouTube will have generated an auto captions, um, mm -hmm. which is not the best. And I would not suggest leaving it like that. But it can, if you don't have a script, if you're like sort of like a pantser when it comes to filming, you just sit down with some ideas and you talk, um, then that's a really easy way to go through and have a starting base to edit and just capitalize, add periods, um, change some very obviously wrong words. It really doesn't take too long from your flow. And it also, it helps Google know what you're talking about. So it can help your search rankings and your relevance in what you're talking about. Um, and I find that if I'm including a transcript, it makes it really easy to make it also like a double blog post. Because I know when somebody links to their website for a YouTube video, um, I'm a little annoyed if I click it and it's just an embedded YouTube video on a blog. Like I'm like, I could have just gone straight to the YouTube page. But on my website, at least, if I link you to my website um it's a youtube video and it's a transcript um so it feels more like a blog post and then i can put things like a patreon call to action or like more info about me and it feels like a legitimate piece of content instead of me just slapping a youtube video on my website and trying to trick you over there <laughs> Cool. Um, so that's, you said something and I just wanted to, um, for the people who might not be putting captions on their videos for like uh, altruistic reasons, it's also, it benefits you personally because it increase, increases your search rankings. It does. Yeah, cool. But also uh, it's, it's really important just like, I think I said it a couple times, accessibility is a really huge thing for me. And mm -hmm. Um, you might have viewers who English isn't their first language and captions help that. Um, and you might have viewers who have a hard time hearing or who are deaf and they simply cannot watch your videos if you don't have captions. And it's just such an easy thing to do. The only videos on my channel that don't have it are like 40 minute long like panels. And that's just simply because I don't really have the time to go through and add that through, but I do also have viewer suggested captions enabled. And I've actually had a couple people go through and watch a video, like a really long panel like that and do the captions themselves and submit it. And then I can accept it. And you can do that on your own too. If you have like already like a hundred videos and you don't want to do it, but you have like an engaged audience, you can say, oh, I have viewer suggested captions enabled. So they can go through and do that if they want. And you would be surprised about how many people are willing to do that. Yeah, I know. Um, I remember the Vlog Brothers yeah. did that pretty a early lot of on. Theirs, a lot of their backlist has been done by viewer suggestions. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that I've always admired about you, Lily, since the first time you were retweeted into my timeline um, is your positivity. I remember, I think at the time, the first time I, I saw you on my Twitter um, is you were, I think, being bullied for a video. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I've been, <laughs> I've been, I, I, I definitely experienced harassment on you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you, for me, you've always rated in like warmth and kindness, um, despite significant challenges that you've faced. Um, and as someone who has a tendency to be negative, <laughs> um, I would like to know how you manage to keep that positivity going. And also, um, I know sometimes like we can present a face to the public that's different from how we um, are in private. And have, has that been a challenge for you? 
Um, I actually find uh, the whole, like, uh, am I the same person? You're sort of asking, am I the same person offline as I appear online? And um, you mentioned this at the beginning. You're all like, oh, you always look so presented in your videos. I remember I went to All of Midwinter last year, and somebody was like, you look the exact same as you do online. How is that possible? <laughs> um, I don't... I don't, I have like a business persona where I am like a bit more brave and sociable in person, um, especially at book events. Just, I get the, the mindset like, oh, I've spent money on this. I better make it worth it. Um, but I am typically pretty much the same person. I'm a big worry wart, um, but that, that comes through on my online presence too. Um, but I just, I've always been a sort of optimistic person, mainly because the alternative is to be really depressed. And sometimes I am really depressed, but I'm also open about that and uh, open about being like hopeful for the future. Um, also, I know that some, if I was, if I was younger, and if I was watching me, it would benefit me a lot to see me be um, vulnerable and honest and open, um, but also positive about how these difficult things that I've been going through have led to better things or weren't forever, um, because it can feel like that. It can feel like it's only ever going to be pain or struggle um, or loss, and I don't even really think that's just, like, a young person thing. I think, like you said, it's difficult to not be negative. I mean, I've had to shut off my social media for the month, partially because I'm going to do, like, a fast drafting sprint starting tomorrow, but also partially because this presidential primary has been driving me insane, <laughs> and I figured yeah. it's probably safest for my brain just not to engage. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did something similar, but maybe less productive in that I just binged uh, Schitt's Creek and <laughs> ignored everything else. So, um, well, that's good. I Sometimes I catch myself. I'm like, you're being really negative, Sarah. Like, you need to tone it down. Um, so, but I'm just like a very sarcastic person, too. So that doesn't help. Oh, I love sarcasm. <laughs> um. Uh, you said something in the beginning. I forgot what it was. Oh yeah, people say that to me too. Um, they'll when I meet them in person, they'll be like, "Oh, you look just like your picture," and I I'm like, "Well, that's the point of putting a picture online is to show people <laughs> exactly. what you look like." I'm always but so I, surprised. I'm yeah, like, but I also know like? as an event planner who receives hundreds of author pictures a year, yeah. um, a lot of people don't they. They, they try to find a picture that is like makes them look the best, which may not necessarily be the most accurate because um, it's at like a weird angle or, um, you know, it's not an angle that you would normally look, look at a person in real life <laughs> kind of thing. I have, um, a funny st I have a funny story about that. I once yeah. got um, well, bullied by a troll on Twitter who said that I was like faking being poor because it was obvious that by profile picture which is the same on all social media was taken by a professional photographer and I'm like it was a selfie yeah thanks for the backhanded compliment <laughs> <laughs> yeah I actually have a blog post that's like how to fake a decent professional yeah, author it's, it's not it's not that hard especially mm -hmm. if you're doing something like YouTube and you're already investing in a better camera like yeah. it's really it's really incredible how few items you need to create a stunning photo. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, as long as I, I think all you really need is a decent camera and some basic understanding of lighting principles and mm -hmm. that's it. All right. Um, can you tell us about your Patreon? Yeah, my Patreon, um, I've been so grateful for my Patreon. I've had it since 2016 and it has been a lifesaver. Um, 
I get a little frustrated about it sometimes because obviously the post the purpose of it um if I say I'm making I think my my hash my tagline is Lily Mead is making books and videos about books um as of late the videos about books part isn't entirely accurate which makes me feel guilty every time I open it up because I'm like you guys are paying me every month and I'm not giving you videos every month but I do have other things um anyone who uh, pledges at any level gets a monthly uh, PDF writing word count calendar that they can print out. Um, and I have a really exciting thing that I'm going to be launching this summer again after I finish my editing program that patrons will have um, a really great um, exclusive uh, benefit for um but what's really awesome about patreon is that when i go there and i'm like hey i know that i've been trying not to lose my house for the past like six months so i haven't created much of anything for you i'm going to try and work on that uh i usually get responses like uh oh don't worry about it i'm, I'm here to support you as a creator i'm not I'm not going to unpledge just because you haven't uploaded a video. Um, typically, when a, a patron is somebody who wants to see you do well, it's uh, the idea of a patron is it's some it's somebody who wants to see you continue to create. Um, and I am so so grateful for my patrons, uh, and they will get all the best details but I think they they're pretty happy right now and I think a lot of people do like the principal writing calendar and I'm going to because that's not like super easy to create but it's something that is um that they've seen to really enjoy I'm looking into more exclusive sort of like downloads for them especially because I get a lot of questions about like graphic design or author branding uh a lot of people seem to think that I have somebody take my photos or design my website or create like my video collateral. I do all that myself. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to sort of invest time in creating some sort of DIY resources for that, that would eventually be available to everyone. Cause that's what I think the biggest problem for me is that a lot of people use their Patreon to keep like exclusive content, like, monthly video Q and A videos that only patrons can see or um, like snippets of writing that no one else ever gets to touch. And as a poor person, it frustrates me <laughs> when something I would love to be involved in, I can't access. I'm only going to school because somebody is helping pay my tuition. Um, so I try everything I try to do on Patreon is either they get something free before somebody else or they get something um that is beneficial to them but doesn't exclude other people mm. and maybe that means like a bit of a more limited or slower growth but it's just it's 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 sort of really against my principles to exclude people if i don't have to and i don't have to because mm -hmm. I, I do pretty well on, on Patreon. Patreon even tells me themselves I'm in like a top certain percent of creators because most creators don't make more than a hundred bucks. Uh, they make less than a hundred bucks ever mm -hmm. on the platform. And I make about 150 um, so far. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. That was, you probably meant just like, oh, subscribe to me on Patreon, but I have <laughs> a lot of feelings about Patreon. <laughs> oh, yeah well i'll say it. subscribe to lily on patreon <laughs> we'll have links slash lily mead i'm slash lily yeah. mead everywhere we'll have links in the description too when the video goes live so you can find all of that down below um and so this is a question that i ask every guest that i have on and um feel free to like take a minute and think about it because i know some people sometimes do uh what is the most important book that you've ever read and why and defining important in any way that you would like. Hmm. I think I have 
I have three, but I can see them real quickly. Um, the obvious one would be, um, I wish I had the hate you give when I was in high school. Um, because if I had had it as a teenager, I would have avoided a really painful experience that I didn't have the words for. And I might not have lost a, a, a friendship that was really close to me because I could have given them this book and they would have understand where I was coming from in a way that they weren't, wouldn't have before. So like representation wise, um, that book was really important to me. Um, Andrew Thomas is really important to me. Uh, career wise, Brightly Woven by Alexandra Bracken was the book that sort of got me into YA and um, her blog as with her experience as an editor in New York um, got me into the publishing side of it, which basically mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be here pursuing young adult as a career if not for that. Um, and then third, my mother, when I was a baby, she would uh, take photos of me and make me my own little like personalized board books. Um, and so I literally saw myself in stories that were created for me. And she's always, always supported my love of reading and my love of storytelling. So um, I, I think the most important book I ever read were those little books about me playing with my own toys um, just because it fostered a very early lifelong love of storytelling. Nice. All right. Um, well, Lily, thank you so much for coming today. Um, because of the slightly different format, we're going to do a little uh, something a little bit different than usual. We're going to discuss, I'm going to discuss the um, book slash reading quote of the week with you before I let you go. So um, here it is. A uh, book too can be a star, a living fire to lighten the darkness leading out into the expanding universe. Um, it matches wow. your background. <laughs> <laughs> it does. It also matches um, what you just said as well. Um, so that's that's really great. Uh, I didn't even plan that, obviously, because I didn't know what you were going to say. But, no, it's perfect. Yeah. Um, all right. So thank you so much for joining me. Um, you can find Lily's information in the description down below. And um I'm going to do a couple of things before I close out the video, but thank you and uh, have a good day. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Uh, thank you, Lily, for joining me. And you can find all of her information in the description down below. Definitely go follow her on Twitter and YouTube. I'll leave those links down below as well. And I actually do have an audiobook of the week for you all this week. We did not have one in the last episode, so it's been five weeks since I had an audio book of the week. So I had to make sure I would have one today. I'm going to bring it up on the screen right now. It is The Mighty Heart of Sunny St. James by Ashley Herring Blake. And the publisher says 12 year old Sunny St. James navigates heart surgery, reconnecting with her lost mother, first kisses and emerging feelings for another girl in this stunning heart felt novel. And full disclosure, Ashley and I share the same literary agent but this book came back, came out a while ago and I finally got around to listening to it and it was um, an utter delight. It's a middle grade kind of like very sweet romance with a girl discovering herself. Um, and I just really enjoyed it. And the narration is spot on as well. And um, so definitely go check that one out, Ebony. I hope you will add it to your, your queue. <laughs> um, so that is all that I have for you today. Uh, if you enjoyed the show, don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss another episode. Tell your friends, that's how you find out about shows like this. If this is your first time watching the show, it is a little bit shorter than usual because I am recording it and I don't have someone to talk about the news items with. Um, and you can also subscribe via email by the link in the description. And also the link for the Patreon is in the description. Thank you so much to my Patreon subscribers. You um, are such a, a light in the hard times of these past few weeks. So thank you so much for supporting me. And you can find social media for guests and the guests in the description along with pub, 
Hub Talk Live social media links. So please check us out on Twitter and Instagram. And I will be back in two weeks with a actual live show. Uh, thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.